So we're talking about testing. And I thought that probably the easiest way for me to teach this to you is to give you an example. So what I've done is I've written a command line tool, command line tool called Perl, and it is for pretty printing the contents of a resource at a URL. So I'll, I'll show you how it works, and that'll probably be the easiest way to uh, explain this thing. So the idea is that I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to run my program, and I want to be able to give it a URL, let's say um, Google. And it'll download Google, google.ca, whatever it is, and it will properly indent all of that. To do this, I'm using Prettier. So we've talked about Prettier in previous weeks, and so I thought I would use Prettier programmatically. So what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna I'm gonna use Prettier uh, as a function call. So essentially, I'm gonna I'm gonna parse a bunch of command line arguments. I'm going to download uh, whatever file you, you request, I'm going to process it through Prettier and then I'm going to dump it out to the console in this in a, a pretty form. And you can, you can use this thing a number of ways. So I have another file. Um, if you look at, in the test folder, I have a sample HTML file that looks like this. So I can also, in addition to giving a URL, I can give, I can give any URI. So I could give a file path to, for example. So I could say, um, test sample.html and it prints it look and it looks like that. Or I could do both. I could say print um, uh, print this file and this URL. So I can give a list. I can have as many as I want and it will grab them, print them out like so. What else could I do? I could I, I could also, tweak the way that it works. So for example, I could say I want to change the um, the indent width to 4, or I want to change the indent width to 8. And you can see how the amount of indenting that I'm getting is, is affected by this. So these are all configuration options that I can pass to Prettier, but I'm, I'm allowing the user to do it from the command line. Um, I could say, for example, that I want to change the width. Uh, I want to make the width, you know, 40 characters wide. So I want the I want it to be print kind of narrow, or I want it to be print printed, you know, at 80 characters wide, and it does it wider. So I have a number of different ways of doing this. Um, in addition to saying width like this, I could also pass slash w or dash w, so I can do both methods will work. So I have I have a nice little program here that lets me do this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to I'm going to take you on a quick tour of the code so that you know what it is we have to test. All of this code is available on GitHub, so you can take a look at it later. And but let's let's take a look through the code. So. Essentially what my program is at the highest level is I have an index.js file and what it does is it sets up all of the command line handling. I'm using, um, I'm using Yargs is a, a, a node module to do this and the details of this don't really matter other than to say that I'm defining things like width and indent and I'm, I'm, I'm supplying some default values, 80 and 2 for the, for the width and the indent. And, um, you know, if you call this thing and you say uh, dash dash help, it'll print out a help message. And that help message is generated by this tool. So most of this file is, is just handling all of the command line arguments and so on. And what I do is I take those command line arguments that are passed to me and I send them into my main function. So my main function is really small. What it does is it goes through a list of URIs. So when you call this, this function node index.js, uh, you have URI1, URI2, URI3, whatever. So as many of these things as you give me files or URLs, they're all gonna get passed in as an array here. And what I'm doing is I'm going to take those URIs and I'm going to map them. And basically for each one of them, I'm going to call this function process URI. And process URI is coming from this other module. 
So what I want you to notice is that my the main part of my program is pretty small. I could make this even smaller, but I wasn't trying to, you know, it's not a competition, but you know, this is 27 lines of code. And most of my program is not here. Most of my program is in other modules that I'm going to use. So when you're thinking about writing testable code, you're thinking about modular code. You're thinking about breaking it up into smaller pieces that you can test independent of one another. Um, the other thing that I'm doing is I'm passing in the width and the indent values, and those are coming in from the command line arguments. So when the user puts in, for example, that they want a, a width of 80 and they want an indent of you know six, that that's what's happening. That's where it's coming from. So this the entire purpose of this file here, this is my user interface really is what this is. It's handling the command line arguments and it's calling my function so that my, my program can do what it's gonna do with all of the, the data that's coming in from the command line. And then when it's done, it's going to exit, process.exit, meaning that it will exit with an error code of zero or an exit code of zero, meaning that the program worked. Okay, so let's let's go deeper into the program. So now, the, the other part of this program is this module here, uh, lib resource. So you'll notice that most of my code lives in a lib folder. So it's not in the main part of my program, it's off over here inside lib. So if we take a look at resource.js, we have another fairly small file. So again, you don't have to have tiny files to, to write good code, but I would encourage you to think about how you can split things up into classes, into modules, into separate pieces, because it's gonna make it easier to test each of those pieces. It's also gonna make it easier for you to swap those pieces out if you ever need to change things in your program. Okay, so basically what we're doing here is we are exposing this one function, process URI. And what it does is it takes a URI, a width, and an indent. So it, it's, here's the thing I wanna process, here's how wide I want it, and here is the amount of indenting that I want. And what it's gonna do is it's going to call the read function. So the read function is an internal function inside of this module. I don't expose it to the outside part of my program. So this is really important because sometimes you're gonna to wanna to expose your internal API and sometimes you're not going to want to. Because I don't expose this, I don't expose this function, it's going to mean that later on, it isn't possible to test it directly. So I don't have a way to get at it because it's deep inside of the code that I'm writing. So sometimes what you'll see people do is they will expose these things even if they're not gonna use them because they wanna be able to make it possible to test it. Other people will say, you shouldn't expose or test these internal pieces. So you're gonna you're gonna have to make decisions about how much you expose. In this case, I only have one part of this that I'm exposing, the process URI function. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the URI and I'm gonna read it. And what reading is gonna do is, it's gonna to check to see whether this thing is a valid URL or if it's a valid file. So if it's a URL, then I'm gonna call URL.read and if it's a file, I'm gonna call file.read. If it's neither of those things, I'm gonna throw an error. So now you can see I've got a couple more modules that get pulled in here, file and URL. So let's just take a look at what they do. So here's file. File, again, is quite small. So what does it have? It has a validate function and a read function, and both of these things are exposed. So the validate function takes a path, and it checks to see if this is a valid path. And so what we're doing is we're trying to parse the path, and we're returning true or false if we can parse the path. If we can't parse the path, then we're returning false. In other words, if this isn't something that I recognize as a path, I'm gonna say that it's not a path, it's not valid. And we also have a special case here where we say, if the path is equal to the empty string, then we are going to return false. So technically the empty string is a valid path, but it's not valid in like, how do you open the empty string? <laughs> like it's, you know, hopefully you're not putting your files in the empty string as a file name. So the other thing we have here is we have a way to read this data. So we check to make sure that the path is valid. If it's not valid, we throw an error. And if the path is valid, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna read this file and then we're gonna return that data. Okay, so this is what happens with a file. 
So over here, what happens if it's a URL? Well, it's almost the same code. So what I've done is I've created an interface, validate and read, which is the same. If you're working with a file or you're working with a URL, I hide the details of how it happens so that my resource code basically just has to validate and read it. And it just depends on which one of these two can handle it. It's either a file or it's a URL. So we go and we work with it. The validate code for working with a URL looks like this. You pass me a URL. And what we do is we try and turn it into a URL. And if that fails, we're going to end up in the catch block down here and we're going to return false. So if I can't parse this string into a URL, then it's not a URL. If I can parse it into a URL, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to check and make sure that the protocol is either HTTP or HTTPS. So I don't want to do things with any other protocol other than HTTP or HTTPS. If you give me one of those, like a file URI or a WebSocket URI or a Telnet or, or whatever, if you give me something else that I can't process, I'm going to I'm going to say no. This is not something I can process. If it's valid and you call read, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and get the resource. I'm using a really great little uh, module called got, and it's kind of like fetch or XHR, but for node, and it's going to go and download this URL, give me back the response, and I'm going to return the response body. So if I'm reading a file, I'm going to read the file from the file system and I'm going to return the data. And if I'm working with a URL, I'm going to I'm going to go and download the URL and then I'm going to return the body of the resource that comes back. So then what do I do with this data? So if you'll remember, we were calling the read function. So the read function is going to figure out which way to read this data. And then what it's going to do is it's going to say if we got back data, then it's going to create an options object where it takes the width and the indent and it puts it into a format that will work for Prettier. So Prettier expects this data in a certain format. And then it passes it to this thing called prettyprinter.format. So it formats it and then it prints it out to the console. If it can't do this, if something fails, then it prints out an error message. And it says error processing, whatever this URI was, and this is the error message. So what does the pretty printer do? The pretty printer has a format function and an apply defaults function. So both of these are exposed. Now this is an interesting choice. In this case, I'm exposing the apply defaults function because I want to write tests for it, mostly because I want to show you an example. But you'll notice that, for example, over here in resources, I didn't expose the read function. So you have to, again, you have to decide which pieces are you going to expose and which pieces aren't you going to expose. Is there any downside to exposing them? There is. Anything you expose in your API to the public is going to get used by the public and it's going to become part of your public API. So what's, what's bad about that is that people will start relying on it and you won't be able to change it. So anything that you don't want to support as part of a public API, you want to be really careful about exporting it. You want to, you know, it's here, but you're not, you know, people can't get at it. They can't call that. Over here, I am exposing this. Apply defaults, what it does is it takes an options object and it makes sure that these defaults are set on it and then it overrides anything that you pass me. So down here, the format function basically takes the options object that you give me and the data that you give me. It formats the options so that it's in the right format and applies those defaults and then it calls prettier.format to get the value. Really, really simple. So what I have here is I have a function that you might say, well, this is like so, so small. Why even bother with this function? Why don't I just over here inside of resource, why don't I just use prettier directly? I could. So that's another choice I could make. The benefit of doing what I'm doing here is that if I ever wanted to swap out some different pretty printer other than prettier, I would be able to do it here and I wouldn't have to change the rest of my code. So it's a design decision. It's not, it's not that one is necessarily uh, a better way to do this uh, than another. Okay, so what we have to think about now is we have to think about how we're going to write tests for this. So what I've done is I have created a second branch. So if you go and take a look at the um, 
you look at the code that I put up, I have two branches. I have a main branch and I have a test branch. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch over to my test branch. And on my test branch, I have a lot more code. I have all kinds of tests that test every aspect of this code. So let me take you through what's involved in doing this. Um, the first thing that I wanna show you is that I have set up my project so that I have a bunch of new dependencies. So these dependencies I've added as development dependencies. So my project now requires certain things to run, but it also requires other things to do development. So anyone who's doing development on this has to use things like Jest. So I'm gonna be using the Jest library and I'm gonna be using a lot of other libraries here, which I'll mention as we go. So I need a way to install all of those. So part of setting up tests is setting up all of the testing dependencies that you're gonna need, which can be different and more complex than uh, the dependencies that you need to run the software. So that's something to be aware of. I've also written a bunch of scripts. So for example, I have a test script which calls Jest. I have a test watch script which calls Jest watch. And so using these is gonna allow me from the command line to be able to run these. So for example, if I was to say npm test and I run npm test, it's gonna call Jest and it's gonna run through those tests. You can see it running all of my tests here. So it says test suites, five test suites have passed, 38 tests have passed, etc. It took six seconds to run my tests. So I have a number of different things that I can use here to very quickly run my tests. And I'm gonna show you different ways that I would be able to achieve that uh, as we go along through it. Okay, so let's, let's start working through and thinking about how we need to um, write tests in order to work with this. So I'm gonna show you two different kinds of tests. I wanna talk about unit tests first, and then I wanna talk about end-to-end -end tests or integration tests. So the first set of tests that I have are unit tests, and all of these tests live inside the lib folder. So what I've done is for every one of these files, I also have another file beside it. So for example, this is my prettyprinter.js file. And this is my pretty printer test JS file. And you can see that it's probably two or three times larger than the code that it is test that it, that implements it. Okay. I have uh, file.js and I have file test.js. And again, you can see that it's about you know twice as long. Same thing for URL. I have a URL.js, URL test.js. Same thing for the resource and resource test. Lots and lots of code here for doing all of these different unit tests. So let's talk about what we need to test, how we need to go about doing this. Let's, let's start out uh, and look at the uh, pretty printer. So we have two functions here. We need to test both of these functions independent of one another, but we could also test them together in the sense that the format function uses the apply defaults function. So that means I can write tests against this function to make sure that it works without thinking about the rest of my program at all. So let's, let's I'm gonna just grab this code and I'm gonna go over here to the pretty print tests and I'm gonna paste it so you can see what, what's going on as we um, write this. Okay. So what I have here, first of all, is I am, I'm pulling in the functions for the code that I want to test into the prettyprinter.test.js file. And then I'm going to use them. And what you'll see here is that I actually have two sections to this file. So oftentimes your uh, testing framework will give you a way to group your tests together. So in with Jest, I can use what's called a describe function. So describe allows me to write a bunch of test cases all as if they're part of one thing. So I'm gonna describe apply default tests. And so these are all tests that relate to this function 
apply defaults. Okay, and let's start. Let's start with a simple one. Let's start with this test right here. So this test says that I should be able to override the print width. So what I'm doing is I'm calling the function apply defaults and I'm passing in an object that has print width 100 set on it. And then I'm going to call this function check options. I'm going to pass it result the number 100 and the number 2. So here's check options right here. What it does is it checks to see that a bunch of things are true. So the first line says, it expects that the type of options, the type of this object being passed in is an object. So make sure that what we get back, when we call apply defaults, make sure we get back an object. The second thing it does is it checks to see that options.printWidth is equal to whatever value I have put up here, and options.tabWidth is equal to whatever I've put up here. So whatever I call. So really what I'm doing here is I'm calling this function, I'm passing it a particular piece of input, and then I'm expecting to get back the result of doing that. So, like, I could do that manually here too. So if I were to jump into Node, and I were to say, um, apply defaults is equal to require lib um, pretty printer. So now I have the apply defaults function and I could say apply defaults and I could pass in um, print with 100. And you can see that it returns back to me an object and it returns back an object that has print with 100, tab with 2, and file path is equal to index.html. So here I am... Um, I'm just automating that process. I'm saying, um, instead of having to go and type this in manually or write a little program that console logs it out, I have code that will automatically do this for me. I actually notice here that I'm returning file path index.html, which I rely on and I'm not testing that. So let's extend this a little bit. So I'm gonna add another expect and I'm gonna say expect that options.filePath is equal to index.html, like that. And let's see if my tests still pass. Now, because I am only interested right now in the pretty printer tests, I'm going to I'm gonna say that I want to run, but instead of, uh, or I'm going to say test, instead of testing all of my tests, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's just test the pretty printer tests. All of my tests pass. And so this is good. The index.html is available on all of these. So what I have here is I have very, very small tests. I have a test that makes sure I can override the print width, change it from the defaults. I have a test that makes sure I can override the tab width. I have a test that makes sure that I can override both of them at the same time. And I also um, have, I have, uh, do I have a test that does this? No, I don't have a test. I don't have a test that that does nothing, like passes in nothing. So let's write one. So if um, should be able to um, give no options. So in other words, if I if I call this function with nothing, like this, I should get back an object which uses um, eighty and two. Those are the defaults. So let's see if that works. Okay, that works. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to imagine all of the ways that I could call this function. What if I did this? What if I did this? What if I passed this? What if I passed nothing? What if I passed in null, for example? What if I passed in undefined? Um, you know, what would happen? And I'm checking to make sure that these things all do what they're, you know, what they're supposed to do. So my function is really small. Like this is all my function does right here. But in order to test it, like all the ways that my program might use it, I really have to think about, okay, what, what are the ways that I might do this? And how, what are the combinations that I might put together? What if I made a mistake and did this, etc. And you're thinking about 
not only the positive ways that it might work, but you're trying to think of all the ways that it could fail as well. What might go wrong? Okay, let's look at the other tests we have in here. I also have tests for formatting, uh, calling the format function. So the format function takes a piece of data like a string, it takes some options, maybe or maybe not, and then it returns back the, um, the result of running it through Prettier. So how am I gonna test this? Well, I have here, I have a piece of HTML. I just have this string of HTML that I'm gonna use for all of my test data. And I have a default set of options that I wanna use. And so basically what I'm gonna do, all of my tests look like this. Test should format correctly if no options are given. So now take a look at what this test does. This test expects that if I call the format function on this HTML, it's gonna be equal to the same thing that Prettier would do if I pass this HTML and these options to Prettier. So I'm, I'm cheating here in a way. I'm not going to try and I'm not gonna try and solve the problem of what this should look like. I'm just gonna say that if I format this and Prettier formats this, they should be the same as each other. And if they're the same as each other, then I know that it worked. And so all of my tests are like that. Some of my tests change the print width. Some of them change the tab width. Some of them change both. And so I'm trying to find all these different ways to go through and be able to to say, what if, what if we called it this way? What if we called it that way? And make sure that the results are all the same whenever it comes back out. So this is a, a fairly straightforward kind of testing that we're doing here. We're trying to figure out all of the different ways that we could go through, go through this code. And this code, both of these functions, they don't have a lot of paths. Like it's really just, you run through the function and there's a little bit of difference in terms of the inputs that you can pass in. Okay, so let me take it to a little more complex testing scenario. So how about the file? So the file, I have two things I need to test. I need to test the validation of a file path. And I also need to test what happens when you read a file path. And take a look at both of these, um, both of these scenarios. Like let's look at read. So inside read, I have case one. Case one is if the path is not valid. And then down here, this is case two. So I'm definitely gonna need at least two cases to get through here. Take a look at this up here. If the path is equal to this, then we're gonna do this. So this is case one. We're gonna go here. Then we're gonna try and parse this and we're gonna return it if it works. So if we return it, that would be case two. And if we have an error, we're gonna return false. This is gonna be case three. So testing all of this code is tricky because I have to make sure that I go through all of these different pathways to do it. Now, another problem that I'm gonna have here when I'm working with a file system is file systems can fail for all sorts of reasons. And I don't want my test to fail if the hard drive is suddenly full or there's an error reading from disk or any number of other kinds of things. So I don't wanna count on the file system for this to happen, or there's like a permissions error reading a particular file. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to deal with the fact that the I wanna try and make a fake file system so that I can interact with the file system as an idea rather than as uh, an implementation. Okay, so let's take a look at the tests. Let's start out with the validation tests. So the validation tests look like this. I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna come up with different kinds of paths that I wanna test and make sure that they work. So let's, let's see how we're doing. So um, a relative file path should return true. So if I give you a path like ABC, that should return true, that's a path. If I give you a, a Unix file path, like something that starts from the root directory, that should work, that should return true. So I'm calling validate, I'm passing in the path and I'm expecting it to be equal to true. So notice that this test here and this test here don't depend on each other in any way. It doesn't matter which order I call them in, 
They aren't sharing any data. Like one thing that I'm trying to avoid is I'm not um, I'm not using global variables as if I can avoid it. I'm trying to define my variables inside the test. I want to make the test as isolated from the rest of what's going on as possible. I'm also testing a Windows path. So if somebody gives me a Windows path, I want to make sure that that would work. And we could write as many tests as you can imagine. So for example, you know, you might say, well, what if a test has a space in its name? So you write another test. You say relative file path with a space should return true. So if I put a space in that name, let's see if it works. npm test file. Okay, good, it works. So our code, we have no problem there. I have tests up here to make sure that if I pass in null or undefined, or if I pass in the empty string, that they always return false. So I'm trying to I'm trying to come up with ways of going through this to figure out okay what are all the ways that this could break or what are all the ways that this could return true or could return false and that's what I'm doing inside of of this code. How about for reading the file? Okay, reading the file is a little bit trickier. So what I'm doing is I'm going to be working with some a mock file system. And again, I'm not going to go into tons of detail here, but let me show you how you do this in Jest. So every every uh, testing framework that you're going to use is going to have some way for you to provide mock or fake implementations of different parts of a system, the file system, the network, a database, a library, um, all sorts of things, hardware, something that's really complicated that what you want to do is you want to make it appear to be there, appear to be working. However, you're going to, you're going to work with it in, uh, you're going to tightly control how it works. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm telling my framework that I want to mock the file system. And what, what is going to happen with Jest is it's going to go looking for a directory called underscore underscore mocks. And then it's going to look for the module that you specify here inside that folder. So over here, what I've done is I've written a fake implementation of the file system module. And so what I've done is I have created my own version of read file. And what it's going to allow me to do is it's going to allow me to call a special function, set mock file data, where you give me a file name and data and I'm gonna put that data into memory. I'm gonna put it into an object. And what my read file function is going to do is it's going to check for that data inside of this mock files object. So there is no file system, but it looks just like the regular file system. The function that my code calls is gonna look like it worked. It's gonna do everything that it's supposed to do, except that I'm not actually gonna to talk to the file system. So now I'm going to expose these two methods, the set mock file data and the read file function. And I'll show you how, how we use them uh, here. So another concept that you're going to run into when you're working on your tests is you're going to need to do things before all of your tests run or after all of your tests run. So a good example would be open a connection to a database, close a connection to a database. So you have to do some operation like this before or after. Or sometimes you're gonna to need to do something before every test and after every test or just before every test. Maybe you have to write a temporary file or you have to reinitialize some data. So most testing frameworks are gonna have a way for you to do what's called set up and tear down. You're gonna be able to set up the state of the environment and then tear it down or you're going to be able to do something before and after you have these hooks what i'm doing here is i'm saying before all of my tests run i want to call this set mock file data and i want to make a file called file and i want to put this data into it so i, I just want to have like a really simple a really simple set of data that i can work with it's another really important idea when you're working with tests, and that is that you, you don't need to have super complex, rich data like you'll have when you run the program. You want the simplest thing possible to make the program do what it's, to do what it's supposed to do. So after we set that mock file data, 
Then what happens is I can use my code like I normally would. I can call the read function, but what's gonna happen is when this code executes inside the test, instead of talking to the real file system, it's gonna to talk to my fake file system, this mock file system. This is only gonna happen in the testing environment. So testing environments are special because they allow you to create special conditions where you can test your code so you can simulate certain things happening. For example, you might wanna write a mock file system because you wanna test what happens if uh, somebody calls somebody calls one of your functions and the function fails. Like for example, it's really hard to simulate certain kinds of errors, but it's easy if you mock it. So you might wanna have a situation where you try and read from the file system and the file system returns some obscure error that normally you can't produce without like corrupting your hard drive. So you can do that here by mocking it out and making it possible to simulate that situation. So that's what we're doing. So the test is going to read data and expect the data to look the way that it's supposed to look. And if you pass in data that, if you pass in a like a file name that is invalid, like null, or a file name that doesn't exist, we expect that this will throw. So if you look at our code here, you can see that this code here would throw if you, you know, if you, if you used it incorrectly, and that's what we're expecting to happen. So I'm testing both kinds of conditions. I'm testing the condition where things work, but I'm also trying to anticipate the condition where you pass in an invalid file name or you pass in uh, null or you do something that you shouldn't do. Does the code behave properly, properly and does it do what you expect it to do when you um, hit it with options or arguments that, you know, that it's not expecting to see? Okay, so let me show you another, another similar idea, and that is testing URLs. So here's what, here's what our URL code looks like. We have to validate URLs, and we also need to download URLs from the web and process them. Here's our test. Okay, so in this case, let's start with the validation. The validation looks very similar to what we just did a minute ago where we're passing in example data. So like I have various example URLs and I expect them to, uh, do I have the same test twice? It looks like I do. This is the same test twice. So let's delete this. And so I'm doing certain kinds of tests. Like if I pass in an HTTP URL, it should pass. I better do another test. Actually, do you know what? I think this was, yes, this test is testing um, if it's HTTPS and this is if it's HTTP, yes. Okay, sorry. So I do need both of these test cases. And I also test what happens if I use something other than HTTP or HTTPS and make sure that it works. But the interesting thing about what I'm doing here is what happens in the read tests. So I want to be able to connect to a server, download a file, and make sure that I get back the right results. The simplest way to do this would be for you to write a test where you uh, download from a web server, google.com, and you process it. And you might think, okay, well, that's never gonna fail. So let me tell you all the different ways that it could fail, or a few of the ways that it could fail. So this past week, YouTube went down. And you're like, well, YouTube's never gonna go down. I could use YouTube, but YouTube went down. Yesterday, a major part of Apple's infrastructure went down. And again, you're gonna be like, well, apple.com and all these things, they're never gonna go down, but they do go down. Uh, other kinds of things can happen. Your computer's network might be configured incorrectly or the machine where the tests are running are configured incorrectly. Or something else that I've seen happen quite a bit is that you run the tests, but you run them over and over and over again. And eventually the server that you're going to starts rate limiting you. So it says you're contacting us too often and so it starts to fail. So all of a sudden your tests begin to fail even though the network request should go through. So this is not a good thing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a mock network request. Now again, the details don't matter that much because every language and every framework has a different way of achieving this, but this is the idea. The idea being, <clears throat> 
that I would like to, I'd like to call my read function, which is gonna do a real network request. But behind the scenes, I'm going to inject a fake network response. So knock says, if anybody asks for this URL, I'm gonna give them back this data. So that's what this says here. It says, reply with a 200 if anybody asks for this URL for the next network request. This is a super powerful idea because it means, for example, like let me modify my test. So I could say google.ca and it would work. So I'm gonna save this and let's run this test. Okay, so that worked. But this is not what you get when you go to google.ca. So what we've done here is we've made it possible for this code, the URL code, to talk to google.ca, but inside the testing environment, we are going to inject our own response. And we can also do some interesting things like down here in this test, we can inject a 404. So what happens if we call something and we get a 400? Or what if we wanted to simulate a 500? So let's say we get a bad gateway um, from, uh, you are, let's say reading from a uh, URL that errors should throw. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna say we need to fake a 502. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna respond with a 502, like so. And let's try running these again. Okay, and everything passes. So it's really difficult for you to say to your team, okay, I'm testing things, I'm gonna take down the server or I'm gonna make the server return errors for the next hour. Hopefully that doesn't inconvenience anyone. Like your users are gonna freak out. So what we do is we use mock network requests, just like we used mock file system responses in order to simulate things working or simulate things failing so that we know, okay, this is working the way that it should if there was some kind of an error or if, if things were going wrong that way. Okay, let me show you another uh, concept of, of mocking just before uh, we finish up on unit tests here. So here is my resource file. And what the resource file does is we process a URI and basically this function doesn't return any values. Instead, what it does is it logs to the console. So it either logs to the console, the formatted output, or it logs an error to the console. So we expect to get um, one or the other of those two things happening. So you think to yourself, how am I gonna test this? Because now I can't get a return value, I need to test like what the console log has on it. So here's my test for the resource. Um, let's take a look at how this works. So I have a bit of complex setup here and the very first thing that I'm doing are these two lines right here. I'm going to override the console.log and the console.error functions with my own functions. Because essentially what I need to do is I need to capture all of the output that goes into those things from other parts of my code. So here is, here's my version of the log function. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a variable called log output and it's gonna be an empty array. And I'm going to take any arguments that you log, anything that you log to the console, and I'm gonna stick them into this array. And I'm gonna do the same thing for error output. So any output that you, you know, console.error is gonna go into this error output array. And then at the end, I will join these arrays into strings so that I can turn them back into strings again. Okay, so before each one of my functions runs, sorry, before each one of my tests runs, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take the console.log and I'm gonna swap it out for the fake one. 
Same thing for console.air, and I'm gonna get rid of whatever array is on there right now. After each one of these, I'm gonna reset the console.log and console.air back to what it should be. So I basically have this temporary switch that's happening. Before the test happens, swap out console.log and console.air. After the test is done, put them back in the way they were before. Okay, now here's what one of my functions looks like. So I'm going to have it read a file from the file system. Here's what the file looks like. Just a tiny little small file like this. And it's gonna read that file and it's going to, um, sorry, it's not gonna read it. It's gonna call process URI, which should log formatted code out. And so here's the expected output that I, this is what I expect to get. So then I'm gonna expect that the finalized log output is equal to this and the finalized error output is equal to nothing. So this is how I would write a test where I'm simulating what's going on in part of my program by taking control of the console logging system or the logging system. So we're often providing these mocks or we're, we're instrumenting pieces of the code in order to be able to manipulate how it works. I'm doing the same thing down here for a URL. You'll see that I am faking what's coming back from the URL using my mock, again, my mock network request. And then I'm making sure that all of this output that comes back works. So I'm calling this in all different ways to make sure that I, I can call this function in all of the ways that I care about and that I get back output the way, the way that I um, it would expect it to work. Okay, so those are the unit tests. Um, all of them live inside of the lib folder right next to the files that they're, uh, that they're operating on. And each one of these tests tells me whether some piece of my code, like the apply defaults function works. It doesn't tell me if my program works as a whole. So what I wanna do next is I wanna show you how I would do integration tests for the whole thing, and I'll do that in the next video.